Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lesson, you are reading the reading assignment of First and Second Timothy, the book of Titus, and a little tiny book called Philemon. And it's in that book, those 25 short verses of the book of Philemon, that I want to spend uh, the majority of this video talking about. It's in those 25 short verses where Paul gives so much counsel that my goodness, if the world would listen to Paul's counsel that he's giving in this little book, the world would certainly be a different and better place. He gives wise counsel that is so applicable today. Pictured behind me is the home of Joseph and Emma Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois. They lived in two homes. This was their first home, and later they would move across the street into a larger home. But it was in this home where two experiences happened that really relate to the very things that we're going to be talking about this week. So I want to talk about some of the things that Paul counseled, not only his friend Philemon, but also the counsel that's applicable to us, and then, and then conclude the video by sharing those two videos about Joseph Smith really following the same counsel that, uh, that Paul has, has given. So the Bible Dictionary, you're talking about this book of Scripture. They, uh, the Bible Dictionary says this is an epistle or excuse me, this epistle is a private letter about Onesimus, a slave who had robbed his master Philemon and ran away to, to Rome, where there he joined the church. Now, some scholars believe that Onesimus was imprisoned with Paul and that Onesis, the, the conversion of Onesis, Onesimus, the, the conversion of Onesimus occurred perhaps in prison where Paul taught him the gospel. Regardless of his conversion, regardless of how they became associated with each other, a few facts that we do know, Onesis, Onesimus and Philemon were connected. And Onesimus wronged by robbing Philemon. He took off after the crime. He left after the crime. Philemon was financially at a loss and he had been wronged. And so that's kind of the historical background of what's going on when Paul writes this letter to Philemon to try to sort all this out and to try to get everybody to reconcile with each other. So just exactly how much or how deeply Onesimus wronged Philemon, we're not quite sure. But we do find out in verse 18 if he, so Paul is speaking now about on, Onesimus, speaking, and Paul is speaking to Philemon, he says, If he had wronged thee, or oweth thee, sought, uh, or ought, put that on mine account. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper, but there's a little in, uh, insight as to the difficulties that Philemon and Onesimus have with each other. Onesimus robbed Philemon. Okay, so let's get into uh, the scriptures here. So that's the historical background. Now I want to pull two parts of those, those verses or this letter apart and, um, and talk about each of those, of course, with concluded with a couple of church history stories. I love how Paul opens up his letter. He talks about, we've, we served together with Paul, who was our brother, and uh, talking about Philemon, our fellow laborer, his fellow laborer. And to our beloved Amphia and another missionary companion, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. And so I love how he keeps using that word fellow, like we're all in this together. You know, we're all in trying to do the best we can, serving the Lord. We're, we're fellow servants, and it's you and me, and no one's better than the other. I love how he did not open his letter by saying, I am the apostle, I am the leader of the church, and this is the way it's got to be. He didn't throw that power trip at him. He didn't pull that upper hand card on him. But he said, hey, you and me, we work shoulder to shoulder. We have different responsibilities, yet we're, we're doing the same work, and that is the work of the Lord. It makes me immediately think of Doctrine and Covenants section 13. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery had a question about authority and baptism. This arose as they were translating the Book of Mormon, where the Savior came and gave Nephi, in the Book of Third Nephi, power to baptize and exactly how to baptize with that power. 
And they said to each other, Joseph and Oliver, they said, well, what's the, you know, what, what's the deal with this power and the, this mode of baptism? Have you been baptized that way? No, have you? No, I haven't either. Let's go inquire. And so they go into the woods in near his home, Joseph's home in Harmony, Pennsylvania. They kneel down and they pray for understanding. What does this scripture mean? And in response to that question, John the Baptist appeared and conferred upon them the Aaronic priesthood, the power and authority to baptize each other. But he starts out that conferral of the Aaronic priesthood using the same terminology as Paul used in the opening salutation of this letter. And that is, John the Baptist says, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer upon you the priesthood of Aaron. And then it continues on. But that first line there, upon you, my fellow servants. Here is John the Baptist, resurrected, glorified being, the cousin of Jesus, the baptizer of the Savior, the forerunner of he who would bring the message himself, the gospel of Jesus Christ himself, that being the Savior. This is that John the Baptist. And yet he comes and appears before them, and he says, just like Paul does, we're all in this together. My assignment and your assignment may differ, but our purpose is exactly the same. And that is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart, mind, and strength. With faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God. And uh, he didn't, it's not recorded that he said that, but that was the, the purpose behind his message. That's what we can decipher behind that opening phrase. Upon you, my fellow servants, we are doing this together. So I love how Paul just brings brings everybody together just calmly and coolly and says, hey, we've got a problem we got to talk about here, but let's remember why we're going to talk about this. It's because we're all in this together. We're all trying to do our best. He doesn't come in and reprimand him. And there's a lot of important lesson right there in leadership. How to, how to be a leader when it's your turn to lead in the, in the church. I think there's a lot to be said there, but that's all I'm going to say about it at this point. So Paul, so then we continue on here. Paul not not only uh, we go back to verse eighteen, which I already read. Let me recap, uh, reread it again. If he, meaning um, Onesimus, if he has wronged thee, Philemon, uh, or oweth thee aught, put that on my account, or I'll pay the debt. If you're so upset because he stole some money from you, I'll pay you back. Okay, so now. Things are square mathematically. Now we just got to figure out how to get over this thing emotionally. But let's take a look at the footnote of that word ought. We go to the footnote of verse 18, letter A, and it's something or anything. Those are the two words. So we could read it again. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee anything. So not just the money he stole, but if he hurt your feelings or if he said he called you a bad name on his way out the door. If he wronged you in any way, let me step in and do all I can to help fix the situation. And once I've got you calmed down, once I've got the situation somewhat under control, then we're going to bring Onesimus in here, and the two of you can figure this thing out. But Paul graciously inserts himself to just really calm the waters and to calm them really quickly. And, uh, and I think, you know, we can only assume, we know for certain that he did that with a load of spirit backing up those words um, as, as well. Now, we don't know the end of the story, but we can reasonably conclude that Philemon took the counsel of Paul and did the things that Paul asked him to do in regards to Philemon's relationship with Onesimus. And we can, can, can conclude that because this letter had been preserved. This letter, and, and really for no other, re, no other evidence, but this letter was a private, personal communication between Paul and Philemon. If Philemon was going to reject that counsel, he would have crumpled that up and thrown it in the fire. But he didn't. It was saved, and it was preserved, and it was handed down, and it made it all the way to the desk of the scholars and the other people who were in charge of 
compiling all these all this great information into what would become the Bible. And so for the fact that it survived and made it into the Bible shows, I think by a lot of evidence, that there's no question that Philemon took that counsel and took it as sacred counsel and must have followed through with it. So although it doesn't say it specifically, I think we can certainly assume that there was a happy ending. Now let's start to relate this stuff to us. We've got three main characters in here, but the two that, that our attention is, is fixated on right now is Philemon, the one who's been uh, slighted, the one who's taken offense, the one who's been put upon, sinned against, whatever we want to call it. And then we've got Onesimus who did the transgression. How do those two people, not just those two individuals, but how do two people, you and me and people we know, how do they reconcile and get over that and move forward the way that we can assume Philemon did? There's a little bit of counsel in the Book of Mormon on how to get these two types of people with this sort of unique circumstance. It's not unique. This happens all the time. So two people that enter into this sort of circumstance, how do they get over it? Well, here's one suggestion. In the book of Mosiah, verse, or chapter 18, verse 21, and he commanded them that there should be no contention one with another. Okay, well, that's obvious, but that's not reality. Contention does happen, even though we've been commanded not to have it. It exists. Okay, so let's continue on. That can't be the answer. So let's continue on. But that they should look forward with one eye, having one faith and one baptism, having their hearts knit together in unity and in love one towards another. So we got to get to this point when one has been offended and one has given offense. We've got to get them to where their hearts are knit together in unity and in love one towards another. How do they get to that point? Because that, in a lot of cases, looks near impossible. There's one single word in this verse that I think holds the key. But that they should look forward, not backwards. Not to the history, not to the past, not to what happened, but to look forward. I believe that when an individual says, you know what, gets to the point where they can honestly say, you know what, what has happened, happened, and it's in the past, and it's time for me to move forward. And when you can get the two people to say that and do that and mean it, then they can move forward, their hearts knit together in unity and love one towards another. It's like Pumbaa says in The Lion King, you got to put your behind in your past. But then Timon fixes it and he says, no, 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 you got it backwards. You've got to put your past behind you. And, uh, and that would be wise counsel to put the past behind. Did I get Pumbaa's right? You got to put your behind in the past. Yeah. I think that's what he said. But then Timon says, no, 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 you got it backwards, dummy. It's you got to put your past behind you. Yeah, it's kind of a clever. But you got to put your past behind you. I think that's what's being taught here in, uh, in Mosiah as well. So I'm, I'm excited to tell you two stories of individuals who demonstrated what Philemon and Onesimus were able to accomplish and what we learn out of the book of Mosiah here. They both have to do with the prophet Joseph Smith. So let's look at the three people in our story of, uh, from the New Testament. Paul, he's in the role of helping people reconcile. Onesimus, he played the role of one who needs to repent and make amends. And then you've got Philemon, the, he played the role of offering, eventually offering that forgiveness. And you might look in your own life and say, okay, I've got this situation. Which role am I playing right now? Am I trying to help out two or more people with their differences? 
Or maybe you could say, you know what, right now I'm kind of like Onesimus and I need to be the one to make the attempt to fix this. Or you might be like Philemon and say, you know what, I need to put my behind in the past. I did that intentionally. You, I need to put my past behind me and I need to move on and get over this. So I've got these two stories and the first one has to do with Orson Hyde. Orson Hyde plays the role of Onesimus. He's the one I'm going to explain. He's the one that's going to need to repent. Hiram Smith is going to be the one who plays the role of Paul. The one that says, hey, you two guys, you've got to get together and sort this thing out. And Joseph Smith will be the one who's playing the role of Philemon, the one who needs to offer the forgiveness. So Orson Hyde is off serving a mission in England while all of the stuff of Missouri is happening. Everything you know about Missouri, the Missouri experience of the church, plus everything that you, that you don't know but actually did happen, uh, meaning all the, uh, all the, uh, the problems with mobs and pushing the saints from one county to the next and the, their, the, the threats and the stealing and the plundering and everything else that took place against the saints. Orson Hyde was in England during all that. He comes back to England. He's sick. He's on his deathbed, so he thinks. Eventually, if he'd get better and live a very long life afterwards, but he's so sick that he's not associating with the members of the church and the leadership of the church, even though he's a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, because he's just so deathly ill. And so he's kind of hibernating in his own house, and he's unaware of what's really going on. Well, this man comes to him by the name of Thomas B. Marsh. He is the former um, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He had been excommunicated for doing some things that he shouldn't have done. And he was, so he, because of that relationship, Orson Hyde and Thomas B. Marsh, they used to be in the Quorum together. Thomas B. Marsh was Orson Hyde's Quorum president. So Thomas B. Marsh comes to his friend, Orson Hyde. Now, you know the background, the history. Thomas B. Marsh is kind of the only guy coming to Orson Hyde to explain what was going on in Missouri while Orson Hyde was out of town on a mission. So he's only getting the, the, the side of the story who's coming from a very disgruntled, upset individual. So what side of the story does he get? An untruthful side of the story of what's been going on in the church in Missouri. So Thomas B. Marsh, he decides to write this letter to the governor of Missouri. These Mormons are awful. The, the, the president of their church, Joseph Smith, he's got these ideas about overthrowing the state of Missouri and blah, blah, blah. And he takes the letter to Orson. And he says, Orson, why don't you sign this letter with me? Now, Orson was wise enough to know that he didn't know both sides of the story. So... Under the pressure of Thomas B. Marsh, he signs the letter, but he put a little postscript, a little PS next to his signature to the governor. And he says, what I do know, or excuse me, what I don't know to be true, I believe to be true. In other words, I haven't verified this, the bold statements in this letter, but Thomas B. Marsh told me that it's true. And so I, I, I'm kind of believing him, but I haven't verified anything. Fortunately, he put that postscript down because if he had verified, he'd know that the whole letter was hogwash. So the letter gets sent off to Governor Boggs' office. Governor Boggs reads it. He sees the names Thomas B. Marsh, Orson Hyde, one former member of the Twelve, one current member of the Twelve, and he sees several other names on that letter. And uh, with that, he says, boy, that is evidence enough. He signs into law the extermination order and starts the proceedings that would lead to Joseph's incarceration in the Liberty Jail. So in a not so roundabout way, but not clearly direct way either, Orson Hyde, along with the other signers of that letter, were in part responsible, and maybe even more than just part, responsible for the atrocities that happened to the saints in Missouri, and specifically to the horrific four and a half months that Joseph and Hiram and others spent in the miserable Liberty Jail. Things proceed. Joseph, the saints under the direction of Brigham and Heber, they get out of Missouri, they end up over in Quincy, Illinois. 
Joseph Smith, Hiram, and others, they spend four and a half months in Liberty Jail. Finally, they're able to go free, and they cross Missouri, and they end up in Quincy, Illinois. Under the leadership of Joseph, they head 45 miles up the, uh, up the east side of the Mississippi River. They find this little peninsula in the, that, that jets out into the Mississippi River. They purchase the land. They start to clear the land, and they, excuse me, and they build the city, <coughs> Nauvoo. A couple of years later, while Joseph is sitting in this room or in this home, it's recorded that he felt impressed that the Lord told him Orson Hyde is on his way. The Orson Hyde that was responsible for so much misery, not only to himself personally, but to all the saints at large. Orson's on his way. I think the Lord kind of tipped him off so that Joseph could wrap his mind around this. Oh, I'm going to meet this guy again. He's coming to town. Okay, what am I going to do? So he had a moment to prepare himself, and then he looks out the window, and he looks down the road, and he sees Orson Hyde coming slowly with his head hanging low towards Joseph, towards this house. Joseph sees Orson. He's already made up his mind exactly what, what he's going to do. Joseph Smith, all 6'3", 225 pounds of pure muscle, goes running out the back door, jumps over the fence and goes running towards Orson Hyde. What's Orson thinking? He's got to be thinking, I am a dead man. Should I just, should I turn around and run away? Should I lay down and take the fetal position? Either way, I'm dead. Is probably what he's thinking. Joseph runs as fast as he can. He takes all 225 pounds of pure muscle and he throws his arms around Orson and he bear hugs and brings him in super tight. They both Weep like children. When they both compose themselves, Joseph keeps one arm around Orson, escorts him right back to this house where he and Emma enjoy a meal with Orson. It's not recorded that, me, that Joseph nor Orson ever brought up that letter or Liberty Joe or Missouri. They just moved forward. Orson Hyde would take his former place in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And this is where Hiram comes in. Joseph wasn't quite sure that Orson, yeah, he can come back into the church, we're going to be reassociated, but put him back in the Quorum of the Twelve? But that's where Hiram Smith, the wise old brother, steps in, and he plays the role of Paul in this case. And he convinces Joseph that this is the right thing to do. This would be a full, complete reconciliation. If you're going to forgive him, it's got to be as if it never happened. And under the counsel of wise Hiram, Joseph says, you're right. That is what we need to do. And he invites him to take his place back in the, he invites Orson Hyde to take his place back in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. The other story that I'll share with you is about W.W. W. Phelps. Now, w, here in this story, we're going to have Phelps play the role of Onesimus. And uh, that is that he needs to repent. He needs to make amends for something he did. Joseph Smith is going to be the one offering forgiveness. This time, there's no role of Paul. It's just between Joseph and W.W. W. Phelps. So in 1838, so about the same time as the Orson Hyde incident back in, let's say 1838. Hopefully I did, because that's the right year. If uh, during the time of this whole Orson Hyde incident in Missouri, we also had a W.W. W. Phelps incident occurring in Missouri as well. Now, W.W. W. Phelps testified against the prophet in a court of law. And for that, in addition to the letter and the other things that were going on, that was a big weight that threw Joseph into the Liberty Jail. So just like Orson, W.W. W. Phelps has a lot of responsibility, a great burden on his shoulders as being partly responsible for all the bad stuff that happened to Joseph Smith and the exiling of the saints out of Missouri. Two years would go by. It's now June of 1840. Joseph is living here. Nauvoo is blossoming. It's booming. It's a wonderful place to be, and so is the church. When here at this home, Joseph Smith received a letter from Brother Phelps. And the letter that came from W.W. W. Phelps is short, but it says this, Brother Joseph, I am as the prodigal son. 
I have been greatly abased and humbled. I know my situation, you know it, and God knows it. And I want to be saved if my friends will help me. I have done wrong, and I am sorry. The beam is in my own eye. I ask forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ of all the saints, for I want your fellowship. That was the end of the letter. Joseph Smith, he read the letter to the saints and then begged on the behalf of W.W. W. Phelps for a collective forgiveness. He asked the saints of the church to forgive W.W. W. Phelps. So in that way, I guess Joseph was acting as Paul in this case as well, because he was <coughs> asking that the, all the saints forgive him. But then Joseph Smith personally extended forgiveness to W.W. W. Phelps in his responding letter. So Joseph writing to W.W. W. Phelps says this, It is true that we have suffered much in consequence of your behavior. The cup of gal, or gall, the cup of gall, already full enough for mortals to drink, was indeed filled to overflowing when you turned against us. However, the cup has been drunk. The will of the Father has been done, and we are yet alive. Believing your confession to be real and your repentance genuine, I shall be happy once again to give you the right hand of fellowship and rejoice over the returning prodigal. Your letter was read to the saints last Sunday, and it was unanimously resolved that W.W. W. Phelps should be received into, into fellowship. The prophet Joseph Smith concluded his letter with this. Come on, dear brother, since the war is past, for friends at first are friends again at last. And what a world it would be if we all could say the Onesimus is in our lives. Come on, dear brother, since the war is past, for friends at first are friends again at last. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ.